Nimm meine Pate, sie bedingen ihn jetzt bitte zu sagen, die Amen. So, wir haben zwei Saints heute, um, about 100 and you know, 25, almost 200 years apart, uh, both from the city of Alexandria. Uh, it's a city in Egypt. So the first is Saint Apollonia. She was a, a martyr, virgin, and deaconess, and she was martyred along with uh, several companions during the time of the persecution of the emperor Decius, which is in the mid-250s. Uh, Alexandria was a rough city, especially uh, for uh, the Catholics there, the Christians, and there, there was a persecution of the church ongoing, and there was a great pagan festival held about the founding of Rome, and a pagan priest gave a dire prophecy of calamity on account of the Christians. Uh, the pagan mob went wild, uh, looting and burning down houses, And Apollonia was a well-respected and high-profile woman at the time, as, as I mentioned, also a deaconess. And that is a woman who assisted at female baptisms, which included whole-body immersion. So not proper for a priest to be present. That's what deaconesses were for in the, in the early church. Uh, well, this brave woman was seized by the murderous mob and tortured. Her teeth were broken by rocks, and what remained were torn out with pincers. A burning funeral funeral pyre was lit and she was commanded to renounce her faith and sacrifice to the gods. Uh, she upbraided rather the crowd for their lack of faith and to show her fearless resolve threw herself onto the fire. Uh, not, not any kind of suicide, but an act designed to show her firmness of faith and her, her belief in the next life uh, rather than this one. Uh, at that same time, there was another group of faithful women who were apprehended by a mob and uh, similarly, voluntarily threw themselves into a river rather than to apostatize and also to preserve their chastity. Uh, they were swept away and drowned, thus becoming saints for the church. Uh, so there we have the uh, St. Apollonia and companions, uh, martyrs in the city of Alexandria. <coughs> Now, um, That was about the year 250. Um, so 125 years later, around the year 376, we have St. Cyril of Alexandria. And uh, the, the, the Catholic Church is no longer uh, um, uh, persecuted, but um, uh, allowed in the empire. And so St. Cyril was, is a doctor of the church, a prolific writer. Um, he's called the Pillar of Faith and the Seal of the Fathers, and he's uh, most well-known and venerated as being the defender of the title of Mary, Mother of God, uh, called the Theotokos in uh, Greek. Um, so we kind of see, you know, what a change from, from Alexandria being a city where, uh, you know, people are being killed all over the place to a hundred and some years later, and we have one of the greatest fathers of the church in the same city, right? How much can change in the span of uh, just a few generations? Uh, well, St. Cyril was uh, a churchman from the beginning. He was nephew to the Bishop of Alexandria, Theophilus. He received an excellent education and was brought up assisting his uncle in all matters of the church. Um, he, uh, his uncle eventually died, and Cyril was proclaimed bishop at 36 years old. Um, as I mentioned, he was most famous for his defense of Mary, Mother of God, Dei Genetrix, as it's called in Latin, or Theotokos in Greek, and it was a title meaning the God-bearer, uh, she who bore, uh, she who uh, uh, carried God in her womb. Now, this was a title that had been in use for a hundred years uh, by this time or more. Catholics were accustomed to calling her by this title, uh, but there was a heresy started by a man named Nestorius. And uh, the heresy is Nestorianism, and it claims that the Blessed Virgin ought not to be called the Mother of God, um, but uh, because humanity cannot generate divinity, how could a woman be the mother of, of deity? Uh, he argued rather that she should be called Christotokos, the Christ-bearer, because Christ was only uh, born a man, and Nestorius further argued Uh, Christ was born a man, he did have original sin, and afterward God joined himself to uh, humanity in a part of Christ's soul. Uh, thus the incarnation, according to the heresy, is that Christ was not actually God, but he gave mankind a moral example to follow. Uh, Nestorius would divide Christ 
into two parts. He would call him uh, Jesus the man and the divine logos on the other. So we still see a little bit of that today. You have the historical Jesus and the religious Jesus uh, argued by <clears throat> uh, the, the, the atheists, the non-believers, and so on. Uh, you know, you still get that today. Well, even in some um, heretical Catholic thought, you still find that. Uh, but anyway, so this is Nestorianism, and um, St. Cyril recognized it as being not only uh, theologically incorrect, but also contrary to tradition. Uh, the, the church, Catholics, had universally become accustomed to call the Blessed Virgin the bearer of God, Theotokos, Dei Genetrix. That had been in use for so long, and now this was a, a, a novel idea attacking that. Uh, and so uh, this, this was a controversy that would go back and forth, and eventually at the Council of Ephesus in 431, uh, the term Theotokos would be defined, and the heresy of Nestorius would be condemned. And this was, this was done primarily using a term uh, called the hypostatic union. And um, that, that's a very um, um, technical theological term. And it means that there is one person with two natures. The second person of the Blessed Trinity, that person has a divine nature, God, with all that belongs to it, as well as a human nature, man, with all that belongs to it, except sin. So the two natures uh, of Christ, he is both God and both man, those natures are united in the second person of the Blessed Trinity. And uh, since um, the, the Blessed Virgin herself, she gave birth not to a nature, but she gave birth to a person. Uh, so that when the Blessed Virgin gave birth to a person, she was mother of that whole person with whatever that person possessed. Be it divine nature or human nature, she was the mother of, of everything. And so that's the understanding of the church. And, and that very clear teaching was, was developed and expounded, especially by St. Cyril of Alexandria. That's what he's known for. And this dogma, you know, it has uh, very many scriptural bases uh, for its foundation. Um, in John chapter 114, it states, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That, that was used for her defense. Uh, Galatians 4.4 4 reads, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. And Luke chapter 1 verse 35 states, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, wherefore also the Holy One which is begotten of thee shall be called the Son of God. Uh, so some familiar lines there from Scripture. And, um, you know, used by St. Cyril in, in the defense of Our Lady. Now, as usual in the church, although this heresy was clearly condemned at the Council of Ephesus in 431, it would not be finally defeated until the Council of Chalcedon in 451, uh, 20 years later. So sometimes it takes several decades, several councils or more before a heresy is finally crushed. Uh, now, something um, good which came out of this uh, was that Nestorius who had been Bishop of Constantinople, he was condemned of heresy, stripped of his position, and commanded to enter a monastery to do penance. Of course, he strenuously opposed this decision by the council, uh, but amazingly, he was obedient. He left, his, his, um, he left the, uh, as bishop, he went, to the, he went to the monastery, and he lived there in, in a, a good life of prayer and penance. And so that shows sincerity. That shows that even a person of sincere faith uh, can be extremely very much wrong about a, a, um, um, a truth of the faith. Now, it, I mean, it wasn't doctrine yet. I mean, this is how doctrine or this is how dogma gets um, is recognized, is you have a council, you have people coming together, you have a decision, and then it becomes, and it's recognized as dogma being true. Uh, so for an Astorius, when something has not yet been so clearly defined, you know, it's easier to fall into that error. So, uh, and then that's, that's kind of proof of it, is that he was sincere. He was obedient to the church. So that, that is a very good example that he gave. <clears throat> Now, there's also a not-so-good example, and that was that prior to the Council of Ephesus, uh, which St. Cyril was, was um, leading, a group of bishops who were supportive of Nestorius, they had asked him to wait because they were coming to Ephesus, they wanted to be present, um, they were afraid that their, their bishop Nestorius would be condemned, and so they asked Cyril, can you wait to convene the council until we arrive? 
Uh, well, St. Cyril did not wait to convene the council. He, he did convene it. They condemned Nestorius, as we've just heard. They made other decisions. And after it was over, uh, these other bishops showed up, and they were furious. Uh, I mean, you can imagine they, they were afraid. They're, they're going to condemn our bishop without us. Uh, please wait for us. And that's exactly what happened. So these bishops, for their part, they held a council of their own on the spot. And in this council, they condemned St. Cyril, uh, calling for his removal and his exile. Uh, they called him a monster born and educated for the destruction of the church and appealed to the emperor. Uh, St. Cyril condemned these Nestorians and demanded that they be sent into exile, and he appealed to the emperor as well. Uh, the emperor's response was to exile everybody. So Cyril got exiled, the bishop, everybody got exiled. Um, so, so eventually, however, um, through, you know, many letters back and forth, St. Cyril was eventually reinstated uh, while Nestorius remained in the monastery until his death. Now, um, it's interesting that St. That Cyril actually has been venerated in the um, Orthodox calendar ever, ever since his death, but he was not added to the Roman calendar until 1882. Uh, so a very late addition uh, to, to the Latin rite, but obviously we see a, a, a pillar of the faith. And, and some of that may have to do with the fact that St. Cyril was not um, your typical saint. He was a very tough bishop for a very tough town. As we heard that, that you know, he would have grown up hearing stories of St. Apo Apollinaria, these other women, and many other martyrs who had been killed, you know, just a just hundred years previous. This is a difficult town. It was a, um, we would say, a, a metropolitan or a cosmopolitan town. There were pagans, Jews, Catholics, heretics, and there were, there were riots going on all the time. Uh, factions were fighting each other, killing each other, burning things down, buildings, and so on. It was tumultuous. And so he grew up in this time, and, and at that time, a bishop had as much power or more than the governor of a city. Uh, you know, very, very much power was available to the bishop, and St. Cyril knew how to be effective. Um, and, and so, you know, in researching St. Cyril, you know, especially in modern times, you come across, um, uh, I wouldn't, almost attacks against St. Cyril, like, well, the saints aren't perfect, and St. Cyril wasn't um, uh, sensitive, or he wasn't uh, inclusive. Uh, you're darn right he wasn't, you know. Um, so when there was a riot, there was, uh, let's see, um, the Jews would riot, uh, the pagans would riot, and so his method was to um, expel the rioters from their city, seize their property, and either uh, uh, seize it entirely or burn it down. He did this with Nestorians, with Jews, and with heretics, and it was a different time. You know, and it's unwise to look back in the past and judge the saints according to modern standards of um, you know, again, sensitivity or inclusivity or whatever, uh, he did what, what was necessary at the time for the preservation of his faith and his people and the city. And I would say, uh, rather than condemn St. Cyril, um, the condemnation of St. Cyril is a condemnation of the people condemning him. That just shows that they do not understand how human nature works and what is necessary for the preservation of truth and the faith and, 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 and proper ordered society. And we, we see what's happening today. Everything's coming down around us. Um, in any case, uh, so he was um, uh, uh, very effective, uh, very um, dedicated to, to preserving the truth, especially of Our Lady. And he would die peacefully in the year 444. Um, and as I mentioned, venerated as, as a saint uh, from then onwards in the Orthodox Church. Uh, so, um, you know, we have that example of, of, of before us of there's going to be contentions, there's going to be heresies, there's going to be um, even good people on both sides. Um, the answer is always the faith. It's prayer, it's, it's faith, um, it's charity, it's love, but it can also be sternness, right? It can also be exile, it can be excommunication. These are good things for the good of the other person to let them know how serious is you know, the, the matter at hand. 
Uh, so I would say let's not be afraid of truth. Let's not even be afraid of contention. But in contention, in, in, in these things, strive for the truth. And if we're wrong, you know, admit it like Nestorius. You know, hum humbly submit to punishment. Uh, but if, if we are following the church, if we're following doctrine and dogma, uh, there's no question that we're, we're, we're wrong or right. Uh, God is right. The church is right. And we can always cling to that. Uh, so, um, uh, St. Cyril of Alexandria, pray for us. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.